Hey again, welcome to Song of Work to Interviews. My name is Nathan, and this is the show where we shoot the shit with people that play instruments. Joining us on the couch today is Stefan Kumera from the German tech death band Obscura. Bit of a tongue twister there. He's joining us today to talk about their upcoming album, A Valediction, which is going to be dropping in a few days. Stefan, how are you, buddy? I'm doing fine. We are just looking into two more days until the new album drops. The sun is know, not right? shining, yeah. it's raining, it's looking quite poor outside, so welcome to Germany. <laughs> Everything mm, Sounds grim. Well, listen to our music, so you know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did have a chance to listen to uh, I did have a chance to listen to the uh, to a valediction earlier today, and uh, holy moly! <laughs> well, uh, you guys, uh, you guys know how to top yourselves, don't you? Well, this one goes to eleven for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what's happening is like uh, I do I do recall hearing in an interview a little while ago that um, you started turning the gain down on the guitar amps and. Uh, that's just pushed the band itself over into 11, is that right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> too good, too our, good. Spi- our personal Spinal Tap reference. <laughs> well, uh, on the subject of uh, Valediction, um, yeah, you said it's coming out in a few days. Uh, Want to tell us a little bit about it? Of course. I mean, the, the album uh, is, it contains 11 tracks. Uh, according to our producer, it's BOM. Best of Metal, so if you listen to anything between White Snake and Cannibal Quartz, have lend your ears to a addiction and listen to the album. I would actually concur with that assessment. That's a good that's a good assessment. Best of metal. Um That's what uh, Frederick Nordstrom just mentioned when we recorded uh, guitars, like acoustic guitars and vocals in his studio in Gothenburg. And he tried to to, uh, to well describe whatever we are doing and uh, it's basically everything well, we have been listening to in, in the last 30 years, so it's it's a quite honest album. It's uh, pretty straightforward for, let's say, our environment, our framework of being called a technical or progressive death metal band. So all those influences we have as musicians uh, just melted into, into those 11 tracks, and there's everything in between fusion, jazz, to, well, straightforward uh, Metallica worship, to old school death metal, caveman death metal, to counterpoint uh, techy parts. So, if you if you want to listen to an entertaining album, I think our know, addiction is offering a lot. I concur with that. Well, uh, listening to the album, um, in terms of the lyrical content, it was pretty obvious to me that it was that there were a lot of highly personal elements to it. Is that something that you'd be willing to touch on? Yes. Of course. I mean, there have been multiple reasons for calling the album a valediction. You mentioned that uh, there was this personal, uh, well, parts in my life in the last couple of years that uh, contains uh, the loss of friends, family members, but also musicians I've been sharing the stage with. For example, uh, Jean Reinhardt, Jean Malone, Alexi Lai, which is to mention a few, the bassist of my other band just passed away after uh, we finished a quite successful tour. So in that department, many, many different things happen. On the other hand, um, we left behind so many things with the band. Uh, I have a new lineup, I have a new producer, a new um, cover artist. Um, I finished a four album quadrilogy with the previous four albums, which took us more than 10 years. And now we have something like a reincarnation, a restart. And simply to explain that this topic well, addiction is leaving something behind you to, well, watch out for new endeavors, and uh, sometimes a new door will open up. And I think that this is quite a nice summary of the entire topic. Mm. So, like it's uh, it acts as a, as a prologue to that four album cycle. Well, it's the continuation of the entire thing because the four album cycle just finished with Illuvium, an album we released in 2018, and uh, this album in particular dealt with like the Big Bang, the ultimate end of all ends. And um, a valediction is more or less like uh, looking back above your shoulder and don't care and head forward to new endeavors. So mm. although this, um, this four album quadrilogy is finished and done, we still try to move on in a stringent way. 
So it's not a hard cut. It's just, well, this is a new chapter for the band. Well, it's, uh, it's a, it, you, you do mention that it is a new chapter, but it's, uh, it's got a couple of, it's a, it's a chapter that has a couple of recurring characters, it seems. Uh, you have, uh, Jerome, uh, I'm, I'm, I, sometimes I suck at pronouncing names. I'm so sorry. Is, uh, is it Jerome? Uh, Jorn. Jorn, sorry. And, yeah. uh, Christian, you got, uh, yeah, they're joining, joining the band after uh, a lengthy break. Yes. And, um, I'm very happy how that turned out. Mm. Simply because I, I knew both of them very long. We worked for, uh, in the past for two albums and uh, we did a couple of tours that has been, uh, I think in, in 2009, 2008, until 2011, something. And um, when I was looking for a new lineup, I simply reached out to them because we have been in touch ever since. And if you know how to deal with each other, if you know all the weaknesses, but also the strengths of each character, but also um, to handle them as musicians. I mean, the bass sound has a particular sound. The, the guitarist has uh, a, pati a particular um, vibe and vibrato, and you somehow have to uh, underline this and let them shine in their particular strength, in my opinion. Then it's way easier than having something new. For somebody new, you first have to well get get a grip of how they how they work, and therefore it was quite easy to assemble the entire record. So when you know each other, it's it's quite easy. You don't have to talk too much, and uh, still you are well working together quite quite uh, easily and again i'm happy it worked out like that and what also connected us with our addiction to the first album we did with those two characters you mentioned is the album cosmogenesis from 2009 we have been in a similar situation with the band back then we signed our first record uh, deal with uh, relapse records at the time we started to tour international with I think the first tour was in North America, Cannibal Corpse, and everything felt really new. Everything felt it's like the next level. We, we made a step forward with the band. And now we are, again, in, in a similar situation. We have more or less done everything new around the band. The entire framework changed. But still, I have those two guys working together with me on music, also David Diepold on drums. And mm -hmm. Everything feels like it's a, it's a new beginning because we have a new record label and everything I mentioned. So it's it's a, a similar pace and it's a similar vibe. But it's it's like going back to school, but you already have the experience of twenty years. <laughs> that makes it easy. <laughs> oh man, if I could go back to school and have the experience of twenty years, I would be so popular. <laughs> you, you would be in the coolest kids of all. Send me a picture first. <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> depending on your music. On oh, my music or my music, music taste? Yes. Okay, my music taste, yeah, definitely on Obscure's level. My ability, look, I can play a ton of instruments, but uh, <laughs> I'm not on your level, come on. Um, but, uh, you know, getting back to it, um, I do recall in, in previous interviews, you have mentioned that um, when, it, when you have a new person coming on, they have to... They have to work for they have to work for their place in the band. It's not like, like you know, say with the guitarist, you won't tell the guitarist how to play a solo. You'll just you'll let them come up with their own solo, and it has to suit the song. It has to be the best that they can produce for that particular piece. Uh, having returning members coming back, and as you mentioned, like it's a lot easier in the sense that you know you don't they don't have to acclimatize they don't have to acclimatize to the way you work. They can just kind of hit the ground running. That would have made. Uh, this recording process in particular a lot easier, right? It, it was super smooth. And we had a lot of fun and excitement working, first of all, together again, but also on those uh, on those tracks, because we didn't set us any limits. But that's also the reason why the album, um, I would say, turns out with a bigger or brighter palette of, of sounds. We have a quite extreme on the one side with um, the Sherpa, which is pretty much old school death metal. But on the other side, we also have a, a song like uh, When Stars Collide, which is all, almost like Rainbow or White Snake rhythm, including uh, clean vocals. So um, this was in particular possible because we had, um, first of all, a very good vibe within the band, within the four characters working on the music. 
but also we know each other that well that we can leave everybody a certain freedom in uh, delivering parts. In the end, it's one name, it's Obscura on, well, the sleeve and everywhere, but still it has to sound like the band. And with those two characters coming back, we have a certain signature sound uh, elaborated over the over the years when they have been there, but also when they've, uh, they've been gone. Mm. So somehow it all has to stick together. And if you listen to any song of the album, you just uh, realize, okay, it's this band. It's this or, or your, uh, originality you need mm. and integrity within the sound, in my opinion. And with those two guys, it's super easy because they understand the band like I understand them. You touched on David before, and this is David's first album with Obscura, is that right? Yes. So uh, with him <clears> being, a, uh, with him being say, the, the incumbent drummer coming uh, into this recording process, like essentially the new guy, like, okay, you had, what, about a year or so for him to, for him to kind of get used to things before the recording process started, is that right? Maybe a little bit more since we have been in touch for, I think, another two years before, or maybe one year, I, I don't recall it exactly. But uh, he was supposed to be a, a substitute drummer for a festival offer we got a couple of couple of years ago. And uh, our back then drummer was not able to, to participate in uh, the festival. But unfortunately, we had to uh, pass on the offer. But still, we have been in touch ever since then. And he's a quite, let's call it famous drummer within the, the social media community. But he's not famous for being on tour because he has a regular job in mm -hmm. Austria. He's located in Graz, Austria. Yeah. So yeah. he's able to do one-off shows, festival shows and all that. But in the past, he was always just rehearsing, rehearsing, rehearsing for probably two decades. And uh, what he's bringing up is simply the combination in between um, playing very physical. We have a couple of very fast songs, very well demanding parts with a lot of double bass again the speed and all that but on the other hand also you need a certain amount of knowledge about music how to understand polyrhythms um well and every, everything uh, we are doing aside being a death metal band i mean it's, mm. it's kind of mixture of different styles but you have to understand both both parts the physical but also the mind mm. and this combination david is well He's executing it basically. <laughs> yeah. When we recorded, yeah. when we recorded the album, he took exactly three days. I went to Austria, recording um, those eleven tracks. And in the past, we always um, recorded maybe three songs a day, maybe Whoa. four if it's uh, easier. And he's simply running through the entire thing within three days. And on top, we recorded uh, playthroughs while he was recording. So what you see is what you get. And uh, also the sound check was done within those three days. So he was prepared simply perfectly. And I think he did two, maybe three takes per song and then it was wrapped. <laughs> it's Jeez. really, really interesting. That's, that's incredible. Like, um, look, I, I, for a moment there, you were, you were starting to get into the technical talk. I love the technical talk. Um, for a drummer to be able to perform their parts in the studio is quite nerve wracking. To perform them well, you know, that's even more nerve wracking. But uh, by the sounds of it, it just like it was just like for him. Okay, it's another day of work. Um, yep, here's the thing. Do you want me to do it again? Okay, I'll just do it again for fun. <laughs> and uh, it must be it must be incredible to have that type of like having somebody of that skill level also brings a level of freedom to the recording process as well, wouldn't it? Absolutely. If you're well prepared and you're not playing beyond your abilities, it's uh, definitely a plus. On the other hand, it's also helpful if you are, you know, your character as a human being is uh, easy. And with easy, I mean uh, lovely to hang around and uh, just having a chat, uh, just nerding about music or technique, as you mentioned. Everything aside, the music is as much as important as the music itself. That's at least my opinion. And I had to deal with uh, many, many, many virtuosos and more people are locked uh, in one room dealing only with themselves and sometimes a little bit complicated, <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. No, that so therefore, uh, being a good yeah. musician and being a nice character is, uh, is the key. Mm, and it sounds, like, uh, it sounds like everybody in the band is, is on that level. Well, we are not 
in our early 20s anymore. So um, <laughs> we have seen a lot. We, we did a lot. We played a lot. So we recorded a lot. We are all quite experienced and I would say a little bit more laid back than a decade ago. You did say that uh, recording the album was a very smooth process, but uh, in the presser that I got, it was also a very disjointed process. Like uh, you guys were all recording your parts independently. I mean, that's kind of normal, but in independent studios through the pe- through the height of the pandemic, uh, yeah, it was uh, it was quite ad hoc, if I if I understand correctly. Um, how did how did you guys? I mean, obviously, you did say that you you coped with that well, but. Um, what's your what was your experience of that? Well, in in the last um, almost twenty years, we always recorded in one studio here in uh, uh, my hometown in Landshut, Germany. We have one studio. We all uh, travel to, uh, recorded our parts, hang out together here and there a little bit, and uh, well, assemble the records. Actually, it was meant to do the same with uh, our addiction, but as I mentioned, further restrictions simply prevented the band of meeting. We, we haven't been able to, uh, to fly in our bases from the Netherlands or uh, have our drummer from Austria traveling to Germany at those times. So we had to cancel the initiate uh, recording date. And uh, the album could have been re- uh, released probably six months earlier. So uh, we had to cancel the initial recording date and then simply had to decide in between we are recording no album or alternative B, we are going to record in national studios. And to be honest, I was kind of skeptical because I am one of those guys who rather have somebody next to me um, producing and uh, engineering everything. And I'm focusing entirely on the performance. If you do both, uh, it's not, it's not helpful. You waste a lot of time in my opinion. So um, we got a lot of help from different people. We recorded, the drums in uh, Stress Studio in Graz, which is quite famous within Austria and uh, Germany. And uh, the bass has been recorded in the Netherlands and both guitars we recorded in Germany. In the end, I was flying over to Gothenburg uh, with all files to Fredrik Nordstrom at Studio Fredman. And there we did uh, all the re We uh, started mixing, but most important, we recorded acoustic guitars and vocals with his expertise. So we somehow made the best out of the entire situation. <clears throat> and in the end, it was super smooth because everybody was prepared, everybody delivered. And even the experience traveling abroad to record an album to Sweden, which was the first time, um, turned out to be very, very nice because we have been welcomed only positive, only positively. So we, we felt very, well, not only as guests, but also, um, well, in the end, we became friends and uh, we definitely are going to record in the studio again. So this entire process was, um, well, not entirely planned, but hoped for it will turn out that way. And sometimes once in a year, you have a little bit more luck than others <laughs> and it turns out well. So in the end, I'm very happy how it turned out and it was quite smooth. Although I didn't think it will turn out that smooth. You actually read my mind a little bit. The next thing I was going to ask you about was uh, Frederick. Um, first question: Did he use the? Did he use that miking technique? Absolutely. <laughs> and, um, yes. <clears throat> and I was quite impressed. Yeah. How he uh, how he cranks his sounds. That was definitely something I haven't seen before. And uh, I'm not a newbie to the game, so it was really interesting to see how he. Well, rapes some amps <laughs> to oh, get yeah. this sound. It was really, really interesting. But um, to blend his Studio Fredman sound, or let's say his his certain touch, because all of his bands sound different, with our signature sound, we had Engel amps sending uh, a Savage 120 custom amp to Sweden. So we combined our sound with his mm-hmm. mic technique and oh, wow. his uh, yeah. guitar caps. So. We had, uh, I think, per guitar line, four different audio signals in the end, with two different caps. And yeah. uh, as a main amp, we used uh, this, this Engel amp. That's um, a company we work with since, I think, 2008, 2009. Mm-hmm. And they basically make this uh, guitar sound we have and as, uh, established over the last years. 
So it, it was very important to me to keep a certain signature, even if we changed the producer. Hmm. But uh, it turned out, as a fun fact, that uh, Freddy Nordstrom uses exactly the same amp, but the model from 1996, <laughs> since 1996, on all of his records. So all those in flames and Arch Enemy albums have been recorded with exactly this amp. So we did um, some real nerding and made some A-B tests with the old model and the new model. And we definitely hear a difference. Just on that, like, what type of difference did you hear? Like, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a nerd myself. Like, you can't see me, but behind me, I have a big rack of amps. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting in the middle of the studio. I love, I love this kind of talk. And I try, to, I try to get a little bit of it in there for my audience. So, um, yeah, what, what were the differences? Well, when we uh, used especially the, uh, the rhythm sound, uh, when, when we dialed in the, the same rhythm sound in uh, both guitar amps, it felt like um, the Savage 120 MK2, the new model, is a little bit more sharp and a little bit more dry, while uh, the one from 1996 felt a little bit, a little bit more open, a little bit more, I would say a little bit more warm, so to say, but it's really hard. I mean, we only had those two amps. It's extremely hard to combine this because I fear in the 1996 model, there are also the tubes from 1996. <laughs> so who knows? how it would sound with uh, new tubes. But in the end, mm. we decided for the new one and we left over uh, the old one and, um, uh, well, at the studio. And on top, we gave um, we gave Frederick the new one as a present. So he's Aww. still there. So every band, every band that is going there and sees a white um, Engel, Savage, well, they know it's ours. But they are free to use it. We just gave it to him. That's, that's really kind. So um, when I eventually get Obscura in my studio, which is totally going to happen sometime, um, you're going to give me one as well? Uh, depending on your production. <laughs> I promise you it won't be as good as Frederick's, but, uh, <laughs> you know, a man can dream. Um, uh, it's always a matter of taste. I mean, there are definitely people out there who are not a big fan of Frederick's production, but the majority is, and I'm very sure that... Um, everybody who's listening to extreme metal for maybe one or two years has at least ten albums he produced in his in, uh, uh, in his shelf. Yeah, w without him, where would we be, really? And uh, uh, he's quite a character as well. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's a walking encyclopedia. He <laughs> I would imagine. I would imagine so. Um, that is. I would love to get into a conversation with him one day. Um, he's a really, really character and a fun person as well so it's somewhere in between um the super experienced producing guru and at the same time somebody you definitely have a good time with uh well after the recording session <laughs> that sounds that sounds perfect um so uh just on the just on the like you were you were talking about relapse records earlier um you've finished that you, you when you first uh when you did cryo sorry the uh, when you did the first album of the four of of the four album of the four album deal, uh, you you had the thought, well, what am I going to do? You, I know I know you're a fan of Led Zeppelin and uh, that type of stuff, and you know you're gonna you you kind of set out to do the the whole uh, obscure version of that. Um, you did that, you accomplished it. The four album uh, the deal the album deal was done, and. Uh, you wound up at uh, at Nuclear Blast. How did that come about, and uh, how have, how have the Nuclear Blast family treated you? Well, um, when we delivered uh, Delirium in 2018, the contract was simply fulfilled with Relapse. But even a couple of years before, labels reached out to me and asked well, how the future may look like, what we're going to do, what plans we have, and uh, we talked to everybody. So we got a couple of offers. And in the end, I decided for Nuclear Blast because I thought at the time, and I still have the same opinion, they have the best intentions. And also that leave me working on the long term. That's something I'm uh, very picky about. I got offers with bigger budgets. That's also uh, important, I say, but I passed on them because I thought uh, we, we 
Well, we simply made the decision working with Nuclear Blast because um, they offered an uh, entire long-term contract I was looking for. It doesn't make sense to have one uh, album off and then you get dropped or one album off and then you're looking for a new partner. Whatever it is, I, I always work with those uh, long-term concepts. As you mentioned mm -hmm. before, Album Quadrilogy, that was perfect for the Relapse uh, chapter, so to say. Mm -hmm. Now we have a new trilogy with uh, Nuclear Blast. And let's see what's going on afterwards. I don't know, but I'm a collector, like a vinyl and CD collector myself, and I want to have everything done exactly how it was planned before. <laughs> you are so, a man so far, we got uh, treated very, very well. That's also the reason we are talking now. Yeah, that's and, right. Um, I'm swamped in interviews and reviews. <laughs> so we are we are two days before the album drops, so quite busy times, but exciting at the same time. It's the best time to be a musician, especially after uh, especially after what we've all been through, right? Yeah, that's a different topic. Um, that's a different yeah, topic. Yeah, you mean the uh, pandemic? Yes. Yeah. Well, we had <laughs> fortunately quite good timing because um, the last European tour we finished in, I think, March two thousand twenty, oh, and okay. just four, just four or five, and no no show got cancelled. Just four or five days after, uh, everything was shut down. No shows possible, and we already planned to record a new album there. So, yes, on the one hand, we had to deal with it, and on the other hand, we had good time. I have friends who simply had to uh, break up a tour in the middle of the entire trip, which is really a disaster, mm. to, to be polite. Yeah. So, we, we have been lucky in that time, but we also had our share of really bad times in the past, so <laughs> it's all in balance. Mm. Well, in terms of the band itself, like um, it seems as though consistency and timing is uh, something you guys are proficient at. And perseverance. And perseverance, absolutely. Stefan, um, I believe uh, we're pretty much, I think we're actually we're a minute over time, but um, look, I'm sure you have some other interviews to get through. And um, look, I wanted to say it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with you. You're... You're really, you're, you're really good to, have, to, to interview. I hope we get to do this again. At any time. Any Just, time. Uh, well, reach out to Silke. It was definitely a pleasure talking to you. And uh, I hope we can come over down under again, like on the last touring cycle, and uh, play a couple of shows for you. I'll be there, man. Would be a pleasure. Maybe sharing a, one drink. Just one? Depends. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> right, Stefan, thank you very much for your time. You have a lovely uh, evening or morning, whatever, whatever it is over there. Morning. Morning. <laughs> have a lovely morning. Thank you very much. Have a nice day and, well, talk soon. Absolutely. I'll be here. Goodbye. Right, Ta-da.